Welcome to WatchGuard's Daily Security Byte Black Hat Edition. I'm Corey Nockreiner and with me is... Mark Law Liberty, as always. <laughs> And if you watched yesterday, you know that we're covering the Black Hat briefings where a ton of researchers share a ton of presentations about all kinds of latest security research. But before we jump into that, on last episode, we talked about WatchGuard's badge or CTF challenge. And Mark, do we have any updates for today? How's it going? We do. So this was the second and last day of the Black Hat business hall being open and all the talks and stuff, which meant it was also the last day of what I call phase one of our CTF challenge. Yeah. Uh, so we awarded our first prize. Uh, we actually had, I think, five people complete every single challenge, which I thought I made them difficult enough that no one would actually finish them yeah. all, but it came down to the wire. Uh, in total, we had just shy of 750 people competing. Wow, that's huge. Which is a new record. That yeah. was our total last year for Black Hat and DEF CON combined. And the other thing, by the way, that, that we kind of know is CTF or badge challenges aren't a Black Hat thing. They're oh. a DEF CON thing. So we've done this. This is our third year. And the first few years, the more businessy people that go to Black Hat, it's kind of new to them. So Black Hat was the slow conference, and DEF CON was where it blew up. Yep. But that's changed. I mean, if it's this big at Black Hat, imagine tomorrow. It was cool. Like yeah. we would, I'd stop by our booth after a talk, and there's a mob of people around it all, like wondering what's going on, trying to get help. Uh, trying to turn in their code to get a badge. It was actually a really cool experience. We brought a couple of our uh, our teammates down here for their first Black Hat. Yeah, and they they had some of the them booth. contributed the puzzles. And they too. had yeah, they had a blast working with all of our new friends that were working on the CTF. So it was wildly successful. Uh, it's not over yet. We've got uh, about a half dozen really difficult challenges going live now tomorrow and the day at well as of right now. Uh, tomorrow and the day after so we'll have yeah. more updates on that too we've got a few more badges to give out so i'm excited to see just how much it skyrockets at defcon as well it's really cool and we do appreciate the community i mean if you catch this video and you help do the challenge we really appreciate your your chats on discord and joining in for the fun with us this is a great thing to do yep absolutely but with that said let's talk about the briefings and some of the research uh, we saw so we all saw both of us saw a bunch of presentations i say we just jump in uh one of the first ones that i think we both saw the title was all your apple are belong to us nerds will probably know the reference there and the subtitle was you unique identification and cross-device tracking of Apple devices. And this was given by Ali, Alibaba researchers. There's actually two of them, but the main speaker was Ming Zheng, uh, and he goes by Spark. He was probably the one that spoke English. And, and basically the talk was going over how Apple devices, the watches, iPads, iPhones, and the Mac, all have ways of sharing information with each other. Things like AirDrop, that make them really easy to do certain tasks when you have an Apple ecosystem. But that sharing of information might allow you to kind of track people, not only track one of their devices, but kind of figure out all the different devices they have. So in a sophisticated attack where you might be targeting a political figure, if you're able to somehow ID his phone, you might be able to get into his laptop and stuff. This is actually a really interesting corner of security where when we think of like security and hacking, you think, oh, I'm going to install malware on it, ransomware, whatever. But this is more of a, a privacy thing. Thing, a very which is privacy. still a big security threat. If you think about how much data these devices are sharing, the ability to track even down to GPS location is big. Now I won't go into all the kind of, he did release a lot of POC during the talk, but the gist of the talk was he started by how do you get an identifying factor of the device? And some examples might be the Bluetooth MAC address, the Wi-Fi MAC address, or the Apple ID, which is kind of your cloud ID. And once you have those, those type of identifiers like a UUI, ID, then you can start cross-correlating devices. So a lot of the talk was showing how here's one way where Apple is leaking Bluetooth MAC addresses. And by the way, the Wi-Fi MAC address is like the exact same thing except for the last two digits. Yep. So the, basically the last hex character. So if you have the Bluetooth MAC address, you have the Wi-Fi MAC address. Then he showed different ways you might also leak the, the Apple ID as well. Now, a, a lot of different hacks, you, in some cases it seemed like you had to connect to the phone and, and run functions with the tool Frida, I think, to do yep. it. But a very interesting talk. I will say a lot of the POC he showed has been patched. It was like in iOS 8, iOS 10, and even iOS 12. 
Although you think there's at least one that was in 12.2. I thought I saw one that was newer. I'll have to go double check that. Maybe we'll yeah. throw it in the show notes. And the, and the other part of the talk, by the way, is once they got an ID for a device, then that's where the interesting stuff happened, where you can start to sniff, for instance, AirDrop. AirDrop is an Apple protocol where I can quickly use my phone to just push a file to my Mac using Apple's protocol. But now that I sniff that, now I can take this Apple ID I have for this iPhone and have a strong correlation to a, a laptop or a watch or an iPad yep. and you can start to put a profile around someone you're trying to track and things like airdrop will leak things like even it seemed like the GPS location in some cases yep so definitely a big privacy concern especially yeah. if you are a person of interest the good news is like you said they're all patched yeah a lot of them are patched uh, like we said we're not sure on the last 12 2 one but most of these have been patched apple actually does a pretty good job of trying to plug their privacy holes and the speaker actually mentioned that that apple is uh, he believes that they do genuinely have security in their mind when it comes to these devices it's just you can't always cover every single one of your bases no I one's think. perfect exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what did you see that was cool, Mark? Yeah, so one of the, my favorite talks I went to, there was actually two that I thought were great. Yeah. Uh, the first one was called Securing the System, a Deep Dive into Reversing Android Pre-Installed Apps. And it was done by Maddie Stone uh, from Google. Oh, cool. Uh, she was actually, I believe, one of the people that helped develop the Google Play Protect. Their okay. uh, built-in like anti-malware notification detection scheme for the Play Store. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was a really Is it the vetting or is it what basically keeps well-known bad APKs off the store? Vetting and then also a notification when they detect an app to make sure ah. that you are, like, lock it down on your phone, your phone. so it doesn't uh, mess up everything. Cool. Uh, but it was actually a really technical talk. She went over... Uh, a lot of interesting reverse analysis, uh, reverse engineering topics, a lot of dynamic static analysis. Uh, but one of my big takeaways that I got from it was, uh, so her job, part of her job is trying to identify um, malicious code or malicious behaviors in these applications that are come pre-installed by an OEM. Gotcha. Uh, so in reality, like especially with a lot of the cheaper phones, these OEM manufacturers are selling phones at like just almost break even or even at a loss yeah. and they get their money back from the advertisements and whatever apps that come pre-installed. Sometimes we talk about the bloatware that comes from certain carriers and it's probably that bloatware on the Android exactly. device that pays them back. And when you've got 40, 70 apps pre-installed on a phone, there's room for something malicious to slip in and part of her job is to try and help find that and then protect the consumers by getting rid of it with things like Google Play Protect and working with the OEM to make sure they A, weren't in on it, and then B, if they weren't, get rid of the thing. Gotcha. Um, but one of her examples they provided, she gave, like I think, four or five different actual in-the-wild uh, examples of things they found, uh, was it came along this concept of uh, app collusion. Oh, wow. Where it's... you not all the malicious code is within a single application. It's split up into multiple different applications where one might request uh, a certain protected system privilege, but then it'll export that privilege so that another application can hook into that, and that's the one with the actual malicious code. Hmm. So you've got the malicious-ish or dangerous privilege here, but no malicious code, yeah. and then the malicious code here, but no permissions to actually do anything. So it becomes a little more difficult to try and identify this stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting. And then the other one was uh, she had an example of this application that came straight from an OEM um, that had access to dangerous system level privileges. So OEM pre-installed applications tend to have more access than user space ones, the ones I would get from side loading yeah, or yeah. Google Play Store. So this one had a lot of system level access, which oh, is wow. dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. And then it had a misconfigured privilege on it that basically exported all of those to any other app that knew about it. Huh. Um, and so it was actually a quick fix. Uh, they, it was, I think it was like a developer tool that they just forgot, the OEM forgot to remove from their production build. Okay. Uh, and the fix for it was really just changing that permission. Okay. So on the code level, like the actual actions and behaviors the app was doing, the malicious app and the benign app were identical. Yeah. It was just a single permission, permission change. So she brought up that like a lot of their stuff, they look at like the executable, like the the behaviors it's doing. But that wouldn't help, the behavior, right? It, it doesn't always yeah. tell the whole picture. So in some cases, a static analysis is almost better or at least critically important to detect this behavior. I thought that was really cool. Sounds like a really cool talk, but but someone that's really powerful tells me there's no collusion, so I'm not sure if I believe it. 
<laughs> Sorry. Yes. Dad joke. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> so how about you? What other talks did you So see? the last talk I, I went to was pretty cool. And uh, the, the, the gist of it, let me find the title here, was a v, it was a VX work vulnerability talk. So the title was Critical Zero Days Remotely Compromised the Most Popular Real-Time OS. That's a mouthful. And, and that is VX Works. And you may not have heard of VXWorks. This isn't an off-the-shelf OS that you know normal people go buy. It's a very popular OS on embedded devices. In fact, decades ago, like these devices are way end of life long ago. Even our Soho, the what what we now call our our, our tabletop fireboxes, the first version of that ran VXWorks. And it is so old. It's literally a doorstop to our training lab right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I. I don't know what to tell you if you have a Soho device. It's probably vulnerable Upgrade. to these, but you really should. It's such an old That's device, you, you shouldn't them. be using it. Upgrade. Yeah, get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say VXWorks is still very popular in tons of real stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, they said in the presentation, by the way, I, I hate the, to hammer competitors, but they used Shodan and found one million Sonic Wall devices that had VXWorks running and had these vulnerabilities. Wow. Uh, it's in things like uh, patient monitors, printers, all kinds of embedded devices have it. So this could affect many, many IoT class devices all over the place. But ultimately, kind of the, the marketing thing they put on their vulnerabilities, they found 11 vulnerabilities, which they call Urgent 11. And there's just tons of really bad and pretty kind of circa 2000 vulnerabilities again. Things like remote code execution in the, the TCP stack the way it processes ICMP messages. You could send a normal ICMP message, essentially a type of ping, yep. and pow, you have remote code execution. That sounds bad. <laughs> Another cool one is a lot of you might have heard of ARP, the ARP protocol. We ARP is how one computer asks the network, hey, I'm looking for this IP. Tell me your hardware address. Yep. But there's another part of ARP called RARP, reverse ARP, which is you can literally say, hey, you that have this hardware address, here's your IP address. And apparently VXWorks will just take any IP that you RARP at it. So oh you could take a secure device and give it a new IP. RARP. So those were just like two of the simpler ones, but there are many others. There's a, a, a particular, another network related one that has the, there's a urgent handler that's part of the TCP IP protocol. Is there's that how they got the name by the way? Yeah. Okay. And, and th there's another remote code vulnerability there as well. Again, it's not worth going into all 11 of these. The point is they were basic stack or heap buffer overflows. VxWorks has no memory protection. So there's nothing like DEP or ASLR or, or any of the technologies that protect the exploitability of these type of memory corruptions. And those have been around for a while. Like they're a bit late on the game when it comes to adding those. Yes, yes. They, I mean, to, uh, until recently, I, I still think the fixes, VxWorks does have fixes. So up yep. until it was like five days or five weeks, one of those, late July, I think they said, VxWorks released fixes. But up until then, even the latest version was vulnerable to all these things. And, and I don't think their mitigations were memory protection. I think they were just code changes. So I won't go into all the details of, they, they went into a ton of awesome technical detail on these flaws. Uh, but one of their demos was a patient monitor, you know, the heartbeat monitor and the blood pressure monitor you'd be hooked up into. The, the kind of important medical equipment. Yeah, yeah, something you want to have the correct information. And they were basically able to change make the heartbeat go all the way up, make you appear dead. They put the black hat logo on the patient monitor. Oh, awesome. uh, last night in the hotel, he was trying to get Doom running on it, which is kind of a classic <laughs> thing you do when you have a, a hacked arm processor or something. Uh, he did a screenshot instead because he wasn't quite able to get there. But the point is, I mean, there's a ton of devices you might even have in your network, like even printers or if you have a network device that have could have these issues. So check the manufacturer to see if they have the latest VX Works updates to fix them. Pretty big deal. Urgent 11. I'm sure they have a, a beautiful graphic image yeah. and marketing website for that too. I, I'm not sure if I mentioned the researchers. It was Ben and Dor, but they're they're actually from Armis Security. So if mm. you go to armis.com slash urgent 11, you can learn more information. Nice. Yeah. All right. So, so my, what was your last one? My last one was actually a really, it was a fun talk. I went there because it, it seemed really cool. Yeah. It was called Discovery of a Government Malware and Unexpected Spy Scandal. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was done by, uh, oh, I'm going to butcher this. It's very Italian. That's uh, why Lorenzo I didn't even try the names last time. Lorenzo Fe 
Fa- uh, Lorenzo. 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 I tried. <laughs> uh, he's actually a staff writer at Motherboard. Oh, cool. Um, and he gave this talk on basically this investigatory journalism that he did uh, after someone came to him with some fishy looking apps. Oh, wow. And so he went through this whole process of they had these applications that they looked weird. They were like, um, he had special offer things like ways to uh, unlock your phone. Like, it looked like crapware like we call it yeah um, but not necessarily malware okay but uh, upon investigating it it turns out they were malicious applications huh. um and long story short it turns out that these were developed by a, an italian hacking company not a hack team but another one yeah um for the italian government as yeah. a way to uh and by the way that's pretty normal a lot of governments yeah. seem to to contract hacking teams in their region right exactly yeah, yeah. but it was basically designed to uh, man in the middle and uh, basically wiretap people that were under investigation. So it was designed to be a, a legal application they used with a warrant. Kind of like Finn Fisher? Exactly, yes. Um, and they're, they still don't know exactly who the victims were in this. They know about a thousand people were affected by it. But they went through all the malware. It was actually a two-stage malware payload where the first one uh, had a, a function that was actually called check valid target or was looking for for specific IMEIs and phone numbers, so gotcha. act like specific people, and then it would go grab in the second stage, which was a remote access Trojan. Ah. Um, and then with that, they could uh, do things like man in the middle of it, phone home all their data to command and control server. Um, but so he went through the whole process of like attribution, trying to figure out who was behind it, because attribution is difficult, but not always impossible. And when you're a journalist, one of the big things is you got to figure out who did it. Yeah, of um, course. So they went through breadcrumbs uh, so that there was a note in there, like a string hidden that was a specific dialect from the south of Italy. Ah. Uh, Calabria. By uh, the way, that seems to be how a lot of times that we identify groups is the little slip ups where language. And, and things like dialects might give away a little bit about their region. Granted, yeah. it's a perfect way to plant a false flag, too. It's true. One of the, uh, one, something I found interesting, one of the keys in there yeah. uh, was the name of a soccer player from oh, that same region. No wonder you liked it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, but then the thing that really got it was there was a hard-coded command and control connection to this website, uh, to this one server, and that server was using a self-signed certificate and they found that same self-signed certificate using Shodan gotcha. on 20 different other servers, all share the same favicon, that little icon that you get in yeah. the browser bar. And through all that, they were able to link it to a company called eServe, which was based in Calabria, wow. Italy. And they went through all this process. They tried to contact that company. The company ghosted them and deleted their website. They tried to contact the Italian police, the Italian government. No one replied to them. I wonder why. <laughs> um, but I, the reason they were trying to contact them, though, was because it it sounds like it was a app designed for law enforcement yeah and they didn't want to just publish this and, and like they, they're at least trying to be selective that ime you mentioned is them not trying to infect everyone but to target individuals exactly and they were genuinely concerned that if they just went publish public with this without contacting and yeah. like making sure that it was okay that there was a big significant risk of putting legitimate investigations into like dangerous criminals at jeopardy it, yeah uh, but long story short they they think they know who did it uh they're very i mean based off the breadcrumbs they followed very strong accusations um, and it was just an inter- interesting story of the background behind this uh, attack it's and an interesting aside too we both went to a, a panel I think the first day that we didn't talk about with uh, EFF Eva Gadiprin and, and Bruce Schneier mm-hmm. and they were talking about how you know the, the we need to as a community get the message out for the public good how can the public hack the industry into good security yeah. and they're talking about journalists who actually have enough of technical background to do good journalism, which is a one skill set, but not to mess up the action. Like if you're a journalist, but you don't have the technical background, you can misrepresent things. And they talked about just a few journalists, some at Mulder Board, Vice otherwise. Uh, I guess Krebs probably falls in this list. So it sounds like a similar type of journalist that has this great mix of journalistic investigation but actually enough technical due diligence to figure things out. Yeah, and Lorenzo was actually on the team that interviewed uh, Guccifer 2, and he wanted me to point this out. (laughs) He says the whole world is getting it wrong. It's not Guccifer 2, it is Guccifer 2. Yes. 
Gotcha. So he made that very point. He wants to set the record straight. Good to know. But still, really interesting talk. It was different. It wasn't really technical. It was just an interesting story of investigating a, a mal- bunch of malicious applications in a yeah. journalistic way instead of a, a reverse engineering way. Cool. It was cool. Well, it sounds like a great day, and we have more to come. You know, DEF CON, I think, is pr- our favorite part. Uh, the next videos might have drinks because DEF CON is kind of a laid-back conference, so that's where the drinks come out. As always, thank you guys for watching. With all the music on the strip here, I think me and Mark need to go and rock out. Yep. Thanks, guys. See you around.